Today is May 10th, 2018. My name is Jason Higgins. I'm a PhD student in history at UMass Amherst, and I'm an interviewer for the UMass Oral History Lab. I'm in Amherst today to interview World War II Navy veteran, Chief Petty Officer Leonard Gardner. Mr. Gardner was on the deck of the USS Reed on the morning of December 7th, 1941, as Japanese bombs fell on Pearl Harbor. Mr. Gardner also served at some of the most significant naval battles in history, including the Battle of Midway, Guadalcanal, the Aleutians, Iwo Jima, Okinawa, and the Philippines. Is that true, Iwo Jima mm -hmm. and Okinawa? Um, Mr. Gardner is also an alumnus of UMass Amherst. Mr. Gardner, thank you for joining me today and for your willingness to share your story with me. It's a special honor and a privilege. Let's begin with when and where you were born. I was born in uh, West Steventown, upstate New York, and uh, back in the hills. Uh, I was related to most everybody who lived up that way. I was a good old boy for, uh, for that area. <laughs> From upstate New York. Okay. And um, is that where you lived during your childhood? No, uh, we were, uh, um, we moved around. My father was a mechanic. Hmm. And uh, and a farmer, and uh, he moved around in different uh, jobs uh, in the New York area, upstate New York area, hmm. and uh, he at the time of his death in 1929, at the age of 29, uh, or the age of 32, actually. I'm hmm. sorry. Um, he was a mechanic and owned a garage in New Lebanon, New York, hmm. which is uh, uh, on Route 20 between Pittsfield and Albany. Okay. Uh, that left my mother with uh, a child, my brother, two years old, and me, seven years old. Uh, and uh, she struggled uh, to keep the family together and make ends meet and keep the garage running, but it was a futile effort. And uh, of course, uh, this was at the very beginning of the depression, of the financial depression. Of course, uh, the country had been veering toward depression for uh, a year or two before that in other respects, uh, in the farming communities especially. Um, she had to uh, sell out uh, on the uh, garage and move in with her sister, her oldest sister, um, who lived in Montague, Massachusetts. Hmm. Uh, that was in 1931. Did you? Uh, in those days, uh, there were no government uh, safety nets. And uh, the safety net that uh, was available to anybody and was expected on the part of everybody was that uh, those who could uh, support uh, indigent peoples and their family did so. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's just the way it worked out. Um, my, uh, my mother uh, tried for a while to get started in commercial uh, uh, drawings, and, uh, but that didn't work out. She finally got a job as, uh, as a typist at the University of Massachusetts here. Of course, it was called Mass Aggie in those days. Um, and she uh, got a job in the pomology department and stayed there until she retired. Uh, she retired in uh, the 1950s sometime, I've forgotten just when. So when, whenever you moved in with your aunt, did was she married? Yes, yeah, she was married, uh, had no children. Did your uncle become a father figure to you? No, no, he didn't. Uh, uh, he didn't. Mm. How did... Um, I just grew up without a father, and I, that was just the way it was. How were young people expected to help out financially at that time? Well, uh, when you were old enough to get a job, you were expected to get one. Mm. 
Mm. And uh, when we moved to Amherst, uh, uh, with my mother getting a job here in Amherst, um, I got a job as a, a paper boy. Mm. And uh, I, I was 12. Wow. And uh, I, di I did that all uh, during school. Mm. Uh, I was a paper boy. Um, ran, had a route that ran up through uh, uh, the university here, or the Mass Aggie as it was. Right. And it was a very small school and uh, probably about 3,000 students at the most. Mm. Um, my uh, route, it was all uh, on, on foot. I started out at 5.30 in the morning and I walked up to the center of town, picked up the newspapers and walked uh, down into the, uh, down the North Pleasant Street toward, uh, the, Mass uh, toward the college, uh, walked all the way up to the president's house, which was up on the hill in the, in the uh, uh, fruit orchard area, mm. which uh, I'm can't even identify anymore. Um, but Did you I, have a bicycle? No, I didn't use the bike. I had a bicycle, but I didn't use it on the paper route. Hmm. Uh, it was all walking. It was. Uh, I walked about probably three, four miles a day uh, on the route. Kind of that counted. Getting up from the house and going up, picking up the papers and all. And um, I'd come home and. Uh, eat breakfast, mm -hmm. and then walk back up here to school. The school at that time was uh, in the center of town, and uh, uh, when I moved here to Amherst, I, I started seventh grade, mm -hmm. and I went from seventh to graduation mm -hmm. in 1938. Um, did you have any favorite teachers? Um, yes, I did. Uh, uh, Larry Swift was was a chemistry teacher. He, uh, I always liked him. I got an A in his class. That was the only A I got in high school, I think. <laughs> wow, that's a hard <laughs> class. Uh, and, uh, but uh, I, did, I wasn't a very good student otherwise. What did kids do for fun around here? Oh, um, well, there was uh, there was uh, high school high school sports. There were uh, inter uh, mural sports. Mm. Uh, there were church leagues. Mm. Um, church was uh, churches had uh, youth programs, and uh, I was in the Methodist uh, Epworth League, and we went around uh, locally to different uh, activities. Um, oh, I had friends in high school. There were four, five of us all together, and uh, we were lifelong friends. Hmm. They were all gone now but me. Hmm. Um, Did you have a, a car in high school? No, I didn't have a car. Uh, one of my friends did, though. Hmm. And uh, and he was the only one with a car. Uh, we'd get out there in the uh, recess period or lunch period uh, uh, in high school and uh, fool around with the with the teachers' cars. Uh, we'd we'd get uh, get on the bumper the rear bumper and see if we could lift the car up and move it and that sort of thing. Cars were a lot heavier back then. No, no the, well, the heavy ones I didn't do. <laughs> uh, the Fords you could do lift up. <laughs> um, you mentioned a little brother. Did uh, did you help raise him, so to speak? Well, uh, we were we were friends. So we uh, we were not adversaries. We were very very much a friend and family. Okay. Whenever you graduated high he school. He was five years or, younger than I. So did you help take care of him? Well, I um, don't really remember feeling like I was taking care of him. But mm. 
certainly I was providing him uh, with uh, com companionship. Mm. Whenever you graduated high school in 1938, um, did you have plans to go to college? No, uh, at that, that, that time, uh, high, high school diploma was considered the end of schooling. Um, <laughs> That's a, that's an interesting point. Uh, and when my father graduated, well, when my father was growing up, um, eighth grade was considered uh, end of schooling. Mm. That's right. And uh, and he went to work right after that, getting out of uh, eighth grade. And I went to work. Of course, I was uh, working when I went left to eighth grade myself. Right. But of course, not full time like he was. Mm. What was your first uh, job out of high school? Well, that was uh, being a paper boy. Oh, out of, out high, school. of high school. Um, I got a job with um, a grocery store as a grocery clerk here in town. As a grain store is no longer here, of course. It was in the center of town, and uh, it belonged to the father of uh, one of my five friends. Mm. And. Uh, uh, I worked in that job for about an, a year and a half, and then I joined the Navy. Mm. Uh, did you volunteer, or were you drafted? No, I was uh, dra uh, volunteered. Volunteered. Uh, I guess the draft had started, but it just started. Mm -hmm. uh, did I, you? I uh, enlisted in November of 1940. 1940, okay. Um, did you have a long history of family serving in the military? No, my father did uh, enlist in the Navy in the, at the end of World War I, but uh, the war was over before he got uh, transferred to any active duty, any uh, uh, wartime activity. Mm. Did that influence your decision to join the Navy? It probably had something to do with it. Uh, my uncle, I had an uncle that was a in uh, World War II Navy. Um, it probably did have something to do with it. Another thing that had something to do with it is the, um, uh, were the uh, movies of the time, which um, romanticized the South Seas and the Navy and uh, the faraway places. And of course, there was the National Geographic that did the same thing. Um, with pictures and stories of faraway places and peoples. So you wanted to adventure? Yes, I think that uh, was part of it. And, uh, of course, part of it was that I couldn't see any future as, as a clerk in this grocery store, which uh, would uh, probably have stayed in the, his family, not mine. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a, a path toward the middle class? So to speak. Yeah, I never thought of it as middle class. I just, <laughs> I just thought I was just um, in just uh, being a normal person. And then, <laughs> right, right. I never thought of class at the time. Sure, uh, most people didn't in the Depression era. No, but yeah, the Depression uh, was pretty stark mm. for for our family. Yeah. Um, but most people at that time were farmers, you know, as uh, at least uh, in the 30s and 20s and 30s. That's right. Um, in 1940, uh, World War II had already begun in Europe. Uh, it had been going for some time in Asia. Were you aware of the war at all before Pearl Harbor? Uh, I was aware of it, but uh, I really didn't give any thought to it. Uh, there was... Uh, at the time, there were a lot of people uh, talking about how these were foreign wars and they weren't our wars, and uh, uh, we're 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 uh, defended by oceans on both sides. Hmm. <coughs> Where did you do your basic training? In Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, at that time, uh, it was. They had just reduced the uh, boot training to four weeks. Wow, that's really quick. Yes. Did you feel that you were adequately prepared in that training? Well, I didn't have anything to compare it to. <laughs> sure. But, uh, 
Uh, I did apply for uh, a communication school after uh, boot camp, and I was accepted. <coughs> Would you like some water? Um, and the communication school was in San Diego. Okay. Uh, yeah, that, that was a real experience. That was uh, my first experience away from home, any great distance. Going to California. Uh, okay. We uh, got aboard train. It took seven days on the train, I think, uh, to uh, get to San Diego. Wow. Um, I was, and this uh, we traveled across country uh, on a train in in um, January. Did you travel with people you had trained with in Rhode Island? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, well, I suppose there were some. I don't remember them though. Did you? Did you make? Yes, I did. Uh, let's see. <coughs> <laughs> Would you like some water? Uh, hope you can edit that do, out. Do you want some water? No, I just... Uh, it's over it. here if you need it. Uh, I think I did have a couple of friends uh, from road camp that traveled with, with me. Okay. Uh, but... Uh, Let's see, I guess, and I guess they were in the communication school, too. Hmm. Tell me about the day you, you arrived in San Diego. Well, it was a, an eye-opening experience, as I said. Uh, I'd never been this far away from home. It was 3,000 miles away from home. <laughs> and uh, here it is, January. Uh, cold and snowy up here, and, and by the time I got out of the train in San Diego, it was balmy. Uh, weather and palm trees, but I just loved it. Wow, I bet. How and long? I'll never forget the train stop in San Bernardino as we crossed over. We uh, the train stopped. We got out for a stretch our legs, and boy, what balmy weather and soft, warm air. Wow. Uh, How long were you in San Diego? Uh, that was four months. Uh, the the uh, communication school lasted four months. I graduated first in my class. Mm. Uh, we uh, we were told that uh, the class would get uh, some leave, home leave, but those of us uh, east of the Mississippi were too far away, and they wouldn't get it. Mm. But a couple of friends of mine and uh, I put our applications in the basket anyway. And lo and behold, all the automatic signatures uh, uh, developed and uh, we got our leave approved because nobody noticed we were east of the Mississippi. <laughs> so did you go home? Yeah, so we went home. I. Uh, got a bus ticket to, uh, to ride home, and I never forget the bus ticket. Uh, it was uh, it was every every uh, stop on the bus route, every major stop on the bus route had a separate section of the ticket, and it was folded over, and then the next section was folded over, and I held it up like that, and it was about six feet long. Now. Uh, it was a uh, it was a wonderful uh, time. Actually, it was 1941. We were not in the uh, war yet, uh, and uh, it was springtime. We traveled uh, along uh, on the bus day and night. Uh, the uh, we we'd stop for breakfast or lunch or dinner, and and they. It never cost more than 35 cents mm -hmm. for dinner, about well, 10, 15 cents for breakfast. Uh, I remember going through uh, Arizona or Utah or someplace or other uh, and uh, giving somebody a $5 bill for my, because they didn't have any small change, and they gave me back uh, my change with four silver dollars and small and small things, 
because uh, silver uh, silver was king out here in the West at that time. Mm. Wow, they didn't they didn't like the greenbacks. <laughs> so, did you visit your brother whenever you came back? And your uh, well, I, yeah, I came back. I visited uh, my family and uh, mm -hmm. my brother. How did they? How did they feel about your joining the military? Were they proud of you? Um, well, I don't know. They, they were. It was just something that it was part of the flow of life. Mm, okay. And you traveled back on bus as well. Yes, back on the bus as well. <laughs> uh, when we got back uh, to San Diego, uh, I had orders to uh, go to Pearl Harbor and take my ship, which was the USS Reed. Hmm. That was a destroyer, 1,500-ton destroyer, uh, built in 1936. And uh, it was, it was uh, a new ship at that time, right. fairly new. Uh, we uh, got in a... Uh, we, got, we took passage on a um, supply ship, a Navy supply ship, and we, as boots, we had nothing, uh, no, no, no uh, standing whatsoever in the Navy, and uh, as boots, we were assigned to chip paint in the bilges. Uh, I remember that's where I met one of my lifelong friends in the Navy. What was his name? His name was uh, Eddie Emanuel. He had a very different uh, background from mine. Uh, he had uh, been, in, he was a uh, kid who lived in Los Angeles, went to Hollywood High School. Mm -hmm. I remember him telling me he, had, he was in class with uh, Lana Turner. Wow. When she was a, a teenager. And he uh, had served time in uh, the CCC camp oh. uh, before he joined the Navy. Was was he Hispanic? Well, uh, I suppose he, he had some uh, Hispanic uh, background. Uh, that wasn't a barrier for you? Uh, for In that time, was it segregated in the Navy? No, um, uh, not... Uh, I don't believe uh, there was uh, too much segregation with respect to his Latinos. Okay, interesting. Um, there was, of course, uh, with bl uh, blacks. Mm -hmm. um, but if he was Latino, I, it never occurred to me. I didn't. I didn't think about la Latinos. Interesting. Okay. Uh, at any at any time in either San Diego or Pearl Harbor, did you get to go out and enjoy the 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 towns? Oh, in San Diego, yeah, we were we were my friends and I uh, were. These are the two guys that I uh, went out from uh, boot camp with, mm. who were both back and uh, both uh, born and raised in New England, mm. and we were typical. Uh, uh, ch uh, churchy type mm. people with uh, Puritan backgrounds, <laughs> and uh, in San Diego uh, there were a lot of uh, body houses in those days, and uh, but we didn't mess around with them. <laughs> uh, we went to church and uh, uh, went to the zoo and that sort of thing. Um, did you drink? There, there was one guy in our class that was always borrowing money. So we, <laughs> he kept spending his money on these uh, flop houses. And, of course, we were only getting, what, uh, uh, let's see, we, we were getting $36 a month. Actually, $21 a month for the first part of the period. Because hmm. you had... Uh, as I recall, we had four months of uh, uh, apprentice semen. That was twenty-one dollars a month. Wow! And then you got moved up to second-class semen, and you got bumped up to 
thirty-six dollars a month. Right. Um, so you you mentioned that you came from a Puritan background. Uh, did you drink in the military? Alcohol or? Oh well, yeah, I did. Uh, you know. <laughs> I was just curious. Not not uh, so much in San Diego. It was more like uh, after after the war started, uh, we got more. While you were on the ship? Yeah, we, we were, uh, after the war started, we were doing convoy duty back and forth between the, the islands and the mainland. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'd get ashore in the mainland and go out in these clubs and stuff. Okay. Interesting. So going back to before December, um, when did you arrive in Pearl Harbor? Uh, well, uh, from the San Diego? Yeah. Uh, see, we arrived about the end of May of 1941. Okay. And uh, I was aboard by June. Mm. I've forgotten the exact date. Mm. Uh, but... Uh, the, our ship was already there in Pearl Harbor, and it was doing runs, out, uh, practice runs of various kinds, mm -hmm. uh, firing at um, towed uh, targets and so forth. Uh, I remember the first time we went, we uh, went went out to sea after I got aboard the ship there in Pearl Harbor. When the when the ship cast off the last line to go out to sea, I was seasick, and the the sea was as calm as the glass. And when the ship came back in at four o'clock and tossed the first line over the dock, I was all over it. <laughs> uh, I tell you, I got the. Got the feeling of seasickness is all in the head. Hmm. And uh, I was never seasick again. Wow. And what was daily life like off the ship in Pearl Harbor? Did you did you live on the ship? Oh, yeah. That's uh, room and board. So that was your daily life was on, yeah, on board. Right. Your daily life was aboard ship. Take me through an average day. Oh, gosh. Um... Well, I was a, um, a signalman striker. That's uh, what I had because I'd come through uh, communication school, and that was my uh, emphasis. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was a signalman striker, and my duty job, duty uh, location was on the bridge. Mm -hmm. And uh, a signalman uh, dealt with uh, raising flags and flashing light and uh, semaphore. Mm -hmm. Um, we did some of that uh, to uh, uh, improve our proficiency. Um, we made flags. We we sewed our own flags. We had a sewing machine, and um, uh, of course, uh, when we. Went out to sea. I, uh, you had uh, you had watches, mm -hmm. four ons, eight off. That was that was routine. Um, and I'd usually be up on the bridge anyway, or uh, during the daytime, even if I didn't have a watch. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a uh, coffee pot up there on the bridge and a bucket of water. To, uh, to put the coffee cups in. Mm. And by the time, uh, at the end of the day, the, the bucket of water looked like, like coffee. <laughs> uh, the, uh, well, there were, there were different, uh, there were different exercises out there, <laughs> but, uh, mostly the, the uh, signal crew didn't, weren't involved in them. They were mostly the uh, uh, exercises having to do with shooting the guns, mm. uh, aiming the torpedoes, firing dead for uh, torpedoes, that sort of thing. 
what was the uh, concussion like whenever the destroyer fired its big guns? Um, it wasn't too bad. Uh, nothing like the twenty, uh, like the sixteen-inch guns on the battleships. Right. Um, but uh, you didn't want to be too close to the uh, to the muzzle mm. of the gun. Wow, uh, that was pretty. Uh, that would that would really damage your eardrums. Did you have any safety protection for your no, ears? No, we didn't. <laughs> Uh, any hearing loss afterwards? Well, I, I wear hearing aids now. Mm. Um, so, is there anything before December 7th that you wanted to talk about uh, on your time at Pearl Harbor? Uh, before the war? Yeah. Um, well, we got ashore uh, on Liberty, and uh, uh, Honolulu was a kind of a small town. Hmm. Uh, the uh, Aloha Tower was the tallest building on in Oahu, mm. and now, of course, it's uh, it's just a little pipsqueak there compared with everything else uh, <laughs> right. that has been built. Mm. Uh, I remember, I remember, I uh, went ashore in Honolulu and went to a civilian dentist to have my. Uh, wisdom teeth pulled out, which were, which were bothering me. Mm. Now, I didn't want to go to a Navy dentist because those guys uh, were just out of dental school, and, and they were officers, and I was an enlisted man, and of course that's a different relationship than just the opposite of what I want to be. Yeah. Uh, and uh, of course they'd go in there and we're gonna yank you, drill you out without worrying about how much is hurting, that sort of thing. Hmm. I didn't like Navy Dips. <coughs> um, we uh, went ashore and did normal things. Uh, the population of the girls in, in, at that time and were, were pretty much out of out of bounds for enlisted people. Mm. Uh, so you didn't have a girlfriend or anything no, at the time? No, the, uh, the women uh, were mostly officers. Uh, if they were in the Navy, they would be nurses. Mm. And, uh, of course, they were officers you can't even, can't even uh, associate with an enlisted man. Right. The Navy of that in those days was uh, very class conscious. Hmm. Uh, enlisted people were uh, uh, subordinate human beings. Hmm. Uh, that's a, quite a different ar arrangement than it is now. So, did you become an officer um, just during the war? No, I didn't be ever become an officer. I mean, uh, you were E7 though, right? Uh, yeah, I was a chief petty officer. Okay, okay. So that wasn't okay. Um, could you could you take me through the weekend of Pearl Harbor? Do you remember that Saturday before the uh, the attack? I mean, I don't remember uh, the, anything particular going on at the time uh, uh, before the attack. It was just a normal day. Uh, the attack. Uh, the weather was just. Scattered clouds, sun, warm, just like every day in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. um, we were tied up uh, alongside of a tender. Had all our, we had most of our instruments over there being calibrated. Our uh, navigation instruments were over there. Our, our boiler valves were over there being cleaned up. Mm -hmm. um, and, that, and our, our ship was out of service, actually, hmm. when the attack occurred. Uh, we didn't even have any fresh water aboard our ship. Hmm. Uh, we had to go over onto the tender and use their heads, their bathrooms, their heads, hmm. they called them. Hmm. Well, to get back to the war, uh, 
the attack. Is that what you want to talk about? Could you take us through that? Yeah. Uh, about, uh, well, most of the officers were ashore. They, on the weekends, they'd go, they had their wives or their girlfriends or, or whatever, and they were ashore for the uh, weekend, except for somebody who had to watch. Mm. And of course, there were two or three of them. Um, I think the uh, the senior officer was just a lieutenant that was aboard. He was a gunnery officer. Um, and a uh, good many of the enlisted crew were ashore. Hmm. Uh, not, not nearly as many as uh, percentage-wise as the officers, uh, but a lot of them had spent uh, Saturday night uh, boozing it up or whatever, and coming in late uh, to to uh, sack out in their bunks. Hmm. And of course, it was Sunday morning, and that's what you did. You, there was nothing that, nothing going on, no responsibilities, uh, no particular responsibilities. Uh, the uh, tender where, where, where our instruments were, where, uh, the, they were on a Sunday schedule too, you know, nothing going on. Mm. So they were waiting for Monday to get busy with uh, uh, working on the instruments. Um, the... Um, I, I was just coming out of the out of the bunk rooms below. Uh, came out of the hatch onto the fantail uh, about like five minutes of eight. The general alarm was blaring like it always did on at eight o'clock on board ship uh, on the small ships that were in harbor and. Uh, the other one, other uh, ships in our nest, there were four of us on the nest uh, when the attack occurred. And uh, they were going off, uh, blaring off too. They wouldn't stop. I thought there was something wrong with them. And just then a plane flies low over the, over the ship, had a big red ball painted on it. Floated down and dropped the bomb and a big blow explosion on Ford Island. My God. I looked up at the bridge. Uh, there's my boss up there, the chief signalman, waving his arms and his mouth was flapping. I couldn't hear what he's saying. And uh, I raced up to the bridge and he told me, he, well, he introduced me to World War II. And he said, get below and wake up the crew. Because a lot of them were still sacked out. And uh, I went down there, and you can imagine the uh, reception I got. You know, wake up, wake up, they're bombing us so good. I might as well have said uh, uh, the Martians had landed. <laughs> uh, but then our, our own guns started firing, and that boy, got them out of sack in a hurry. Uh, they had to, we had awnings over the fantail. They had to be ripped off and cut with knives. Well, of course, that would have got a court martial in the, if it hadn't been war. Uh, and uh, uh, we were, uh, we had five, five inch guns on, on the ship at that time. And uh, the three of them were on the stern part and two of them in the bow part. Uh, our nest was was uh, tied to a buoy, and it was oriented toward the shore. Well, the shore in uh, Oahu uh, went up sharply to the uh, volcanic mountains mm -hmm. in the center of the island. And the Japanese were coming over those mountains, and they had to drop down quickly to uh, release their torpedoes or their bombs uh, onto the battleships and big big other targets that they had in mind. Um, and we were too close to the shore for them to really focus on us. But our stern guns, they uh, managed to get a good uh, 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 
uh, eye, uh, eye uh, contact to aim at the uh, planes coming coming down on uh, Fort Island and so on. Um, the two bow guns start, tried to fire at the planes too, but all they could do was shoot straight up. Mm-hmm. And uh, somebody on the on the tender on the flying bridge came right over to the edge of the ship, and there's our here's our guns right there at the 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 muzzle of the guns about even with the flying bridge on the tender, and so somebody came over to shout a shout something down to one of our somebody on our ships, and he darn near had his head blown off. I mean, well, he lost his hearing for a while, I'm sure. Right. We were told quickly after that to secure our bow guns. Hmm. Uh, but uh, as soon as the attack occur, uh, started, why, why our, the, the people that we had ashore had aboard started racing over to the uh, tender to pick up uh, the pieces and parts and instruments and so forth that had been put over there. And uh, boy, I, uh, you take a take a uh, somebody said the one of the valves on the engine taking two people to carry it over to the to the tender. One guy carried it back. Wow. Uh, I know the uh, the quartermaster had to crawl through a porthole to uh, get at his uh, instruments that were over there because the door uh, into the room where they were was locked. Mm. Um, we scrambled to get our ships back together and uh, I was uh, uh, helping out down at the gun, at the gun level uh, because they were short, short-handed because of the people ashore and uh, uh, I was carrying uh, 50 caliber ammunition up to the uh, 50 caliber guns up on the, uh, the after bridge, the, uh, those guns uh, froze up quickly after, in the firing because somebody forgot to turn the water on of it. They were air cooled, I mean, water cooled uh, 50 caliber guns. Um, uh, down at the, uh, on the fantail, uh, there was a, a gunner who was, uh, our five-inch guns were used semi-fixed ammunition. That's meant that we had a projectile and a bag of gunpowder. They were separate. And uh, this uh, gunner was trying to ram both those things into his breech, and it wouldn't fit. So he pulled out the guy, bag of gunpowder and sawed off a piece of a section of it so it would fit. Wow. And he had a, uh, a stub of a cigar in his mouth when he was doing that. And I never forgot that. I said, my God, and there was I was standing there watching him doing that. Uh, so you mentioned that you saw a plane come across, fly across the ship, and yeah. you saw a red circle on it. At what point did it occur to you that these were Japanese enemy planes? Well, I suppose immediately. Hmm. Were you shocked that the Japanese were capable of attacking? Well, uh, it was everything was so uh, sudden, and exciting, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, chaos. It was chaos. I mean, mm-hmm. I didn't have time to think about it, all right. those things. Wow. How? I mean, how did you react in that situation? Uh, did your training kick in at that oh, point? Oh yeah, that's what you were. Everything is automatic because you had all this uh, training. Hmm. Now, that that's uh, the purpose of it. Whenever the ship was firing at the airplanes, did any of the aircraft uh, get shot down? Well, uh, the planes got shot down, and of course, the other ships were firing too. It was hard to say hard to who tell. shot who. who. Mm, wow. Um, I suppose there was a lot of claims, probably more 
more claims than there were actual casualties. So how long how long do you think that the attacks went on? Uh, they went on for about uh, about an hour and a half. Hmm. Uh, the first wave came in, and uh, it was pretty much over uh, before the second wave came in. By the time the second wave came in, uh, the harbor was awash in oil. They had uh, torpedoed a number of ships. Uh, oil was leaking into the harbor. Uh, some of that oil was in flames. Uh, so crew members were jumping off the ship into the oil-covered water. Mm. Uh, and uh, Eventually, of course, the Oklahoma capsized went upside down. The Arizona sunk. The uh, Tennessee, the Pennsylvania, uh, Maryland, I think, uh, they all got damaged. The Nevada got underway, and it was torpedoed as it as it uh, tried to get out of out of the harbor. And it rammed itself. Uh, they rammed it into the bank on uh, the opposite side of Fort Island, so that it wouldn't block the passage. Mm. Um, the uh, we got our ship back together again in about uh, late morning, and uh, got got our uh, uh, boilers uh, going. Uh, we had steam up enough to get going, just barely. The captain uh, got aboard ship just before we got underway. Uh, he was lucky to be able to get back in time because he he and he li he lived with his wife ashore. Hmm. Um, um, let's see. I think uh, as we left uh, as we left the harbor, I remember the uh, the galley produced some sandwiches for us, hmm. which is the first meal we had of the day. Um, you can imagine uh, getting. We were one of the first ships out of the harbor, actually. Uh, you can imagine the anguish. Uh, we actually we experienced as we left the harbor um, what was out there. I mean, where did those planes come from? They had to come from something. Hmm. Uh, and was a Japanese fleet out there or was it waiting for us to show up? Uh, we didn't know. And we didn't know what was going on in the, at home either. Hmm. Was the, uh, the United States being bombed? Well, what we did know was that there were rumors flying like crazy all, uh, all over the area. Uh, Honolulu Radio was reporting all the rumors, and they kept repeating them. The Japanese have landed over here. Another airstrike over there. Uh, they're, they're bombing the United States. Uh, they had all kinds of rumors like that, and they kept repeating them. Uh, uh, the uh, anti-aircraft uh, uh, gunners were firing at uh, anything that's up in the air, including our own planes. Um, <coughs> it, was, it was complete chaos. The uh, oh, let's see, I lost my track of thought. So. Uh, were there rescue operations going on at that time? Was your destroyer engaged in any of that? No, we didn't do any rescuing as on the way out. Our, our main thrust was to get out of the harbor because mm. that was where the uh, attack was taking place, and uh, and and to of course to accost the uh, Japanese fleet if we could find it. Mm. It would have been a suicide mission, of course. We had found it. 
Um, but we were ordered, uh, as soon as we got out of the harbor, to make a fast run around the island of Oahu, to mm -hmm. see if we could find any enemy. And uh, we did that. Took us a uh, couple of days. It was uh, that night we uh, crossed through the Kauai Channel. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a dark night. It was the first night, first night time we'd been at sea without any lights. It was a dark night. The rough, uh, the channel was rough. It was very tense. I had the eight to midnight watch, and uh, it was quite an experience to to uh, be underway without lights. And hardly, I guess there wasn't any moon. For I never looked it up to see if there was. But, uh, so, <clears throat> you're you're describing kind of this sense of the unknown at that time. You didn't know what was waiting on you. Um, what was the feeling among the crew? Was it, was it grief? Was it, you know, revenge? What was the, the atmosphere like? Well, I, we, we have some of that uh, on my website from other, other people. I think the only comment I remember anybody making was, um, he said he was thinking that he had $300 on the books and, uh, who was ever going to believe him? <laughs> wow. uh, at, at what point did you begin to understand how much damage was caused in Pearl Harbor? Well, uh, as a person, I, uh, I never, I was always a, I was always an observer of what's going on. Hmm. I never gave depth, in-depth thought about the the significance of it all. Um, I noticed uh, things like we were, for example, uh, we uh, we were heading south of, of the islands. A few days, well, about a, about a week, maybe a few days to a week after the attack, because we'd heard rumors of a uh, Japanese uh, task force uh, down there, down by Palmyra Island or uh, Johnson Island. And uh, we went down, we were assigned to the task force. There were two destroyers and one cruiser. You can imagine uh, Japanese had all these battleships and carriers and stuff. Uh, we uh, we fortunately didn't have our carriers in the harbor. Mm -hmm. That was a uh, just a stroke of luck, right? Because uh, the, the task force with our just uh, carriers were uh, coming in. They were supposed to be in the day before the attack, mm -hmm. but uh, they had been delayed and uh, came in later. Uh, that was a stroke of luck for us, uh, because uh, they, what they ended up doing was relieving us of the burden of trying to support uh, battleships, which were no longer. All right, we're picking back up. You were talking about the aircraft carriers being out of the harbor, so that was the point that the aircraft carriers really became the, the strength of the Navy. At least right. in the Pacific. They were, they were the core of the task forces and the fleets. Mm. Uh, and the Japanese bill relieved us of the burden of uh, trying to make something go with the battleships. With all the, and they were, of course, the battleships were soaking up all the manpower and mm -hmm. doing very little good, good as far as. Uh, the enemy was concerned. Right. Um, so, in the days after the bombing, um, well, I wanted to ask this. Did you actually hear the president's speech uh, announcing the declaration of war? No, I didn't. You didn't hear it because you were on the ship. <laughs> yeah, I've heard it many times since, of course. <laughs> right. But I, I, I presume you, you 
you didn't need someone to tell you, no. <laughs> right? You were there. Um, how long were you out at sea after the attack? Did you stay out there doing these convoys between Hawaii well, and the mainland? Uh, well, our, we first, the first time we left the harbor during the attack, uh, we were sent around to circle, circumnavigate the island. Mm -hmm. And we did that for a couple of days and came back in. We were low on fuel, low on supplies, low on ammunition, that kind of stuff. And at that point, and we had to get our ship back together again because a lot of it hadn't been retrieved or put back in commission. Um, the uh, when we got back in, there was uh, there was a one of the Japanese mini subs mm -hmm. had been had gotten into the harbor, and uh, when we tied up the tender, why uh, they chased this mini sub into the shallow is not far from where we were mm -hmm. and the thing got stuck in the mud <laughs> and uh, we we captured that one yeah i've read about that 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 leads me to a question um did you see the movie tora 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 yes what did you think about that film well i thought it was pretty good of course it did show the uh, the uh, japanese planes weaving in between the battleships that's one thing I noticed, battleships were too close together to weave it between them. Right. Um, but, uh, but otherwise, it was a good, it was a good movie. Um, well, I have to ask this one now. What about the, the more recent film about Pearl Harbor? The one with Ben Affleck and, uh, I think it's called Pearl Harbor. Yeah, well, yeah, I guess it was. I've forgotten what it was called. Um, well, that was a good movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just curious about, uh, you know, how Hollywood has portrayed the event, and if you think it's accurate or. Well, as far as I, I wasn't there, where uh, where they were talking about, of course they were they were uh, in the Army Air Force. Right, right, right. And uh, they were they were focusing on what they were doing. Sure. Um, I didn't see. Any army, any uh, U, U.S. aircraft in mm -hmm. the air when I was during right. the attack. Right. Um, but you did see the damage after coming back in, right? Uh, so whenever you oh, came yeah, back in yeah, for the resupply, right? right. How? Uh, what were your impressions at that time? Whenever you came back to Pearl Harbor? Well, I don't remember. Uh, I was just. Uh, I don't remember being uh, irritated, angry, or anything like that. It was mm. just, uh, it was just part of life. <laughs> wow. Um, so during the meantime, between Pearl Harbor and really, it was almost two years before the Navy was rebuilt, and you know, you were at the Battle of Midway, which was kind of a turning point. Yeah, about war. that. Uh, now I was not. Part of the uh, uh, sinking of the Japanese carriers. Right. Uh, we uh, sup we uh, convoyed supplies mm. to Midway before the attack, and uh, we were sent to the Aleutians mm -hmm. uh, to uh, in ad in advance of the attack uh, to ward off um, Japanese incursions up there, which was one of the feints as mm -hmm. part of the Battle of Midway. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the Aleutians was part of the Battle of Midway. Right. And, and they chased us up there, too. Uh, they, the Japanese had two carriers up there mm -hmm. with support ships and cruisers and destroyers, and uh, they were bombing Dutch Harbor. They landed troops on Kiska and Natu. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, we we uh, bombarded Kiska. They sent a plane out to try to bombard us. Got lost in the fog. Mm. The uh, the Aleutians were uh, a, a real interesting navigation problem. Mm. The uh, the fog 
moved in off the Aleutians. Sometimes it would be rise up just about uh, 10, 15 feet off the water. Mm. And if you're on the deck, you could see to the horizon. Hmm. But if you're up on the bridge, you're completely fogged in. Wow. And other times it'd be just the opposite. It would lay on the water and you couldn't see anything from the deck. And you'd, up there on the bridge, you'd be up in the sunshine. Wow. And so other times, of course, you were completely fogged in up and down. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Japanese carriers, uh, the carrier planes, uh, spotted us. Uh, we were, uh, we were, I think, uh, two or three, two, maybe two uh, destroyers of uh, like ours, and uh, a couple of old World War One destroyers. Mm -hmm. uh, And we had a had a light cruiser with uh, was uh, a new one mm -hmm. with the fast firing six inch guns. Mm -hmm. um, they spotted us, and we were we were on the other side of Unalaska. That's where Dutch Harbor is, uh, in a alco over a, a little ar a little harbor area, uh, and the Japanese. Swallowed us, and they sent uh, they sent uh, an attack force hmm. aircraft that aircraft attack, uh, task force <coughs> uh, to uh, uh, bomb us, hmm. but they got lost in the fog. Wow! And uh, they never did never did show up. But uh, the uh, the tides in uh, the Aleutians are prodigious, as uh, Captain Cook said. <laughs> um, my gosh, we were we pulled up on the alongside the dock in Kodiak, I guess it was, uh, and we were we were way down in the uh, our water was way down, and we had to climb up to get to the dock off the from our deck. Mm -hmm. Came back when we went ashore, and there was not much, not much there except totem poles and and uh, bars. Wow. Um, but when we came back, the tide had come in, and our ship was way up there, and you had to climb up <laughs> to get into the ship. Wow. I mean, the, the tide was like twenty feet. Wow. Twenty two okay. feet, I think. Wow. It was prodigious, is what it was. I, uh, I read somewhere that um, the USS Reed captured a submarine or sunk a submarine, right? And captured Japanese prisoners right. during this. We mess? did. We uh, um, this was in the Aleutians, and uh, a naval aircraft had uh, spotted this uh, submarine, and we. Uh, steamed over to get into the action mm. and they dived and we uh, depth charged them and damaged them and they came to the surface and um, and the ship the submarine sank and uh, uh, quite a few Japanese crewmen got off but uh, the water up there is about 40 degrees Wow. And you can't survive in that temperature water more than a few minutes. Mm -hmm. And uh, by the time we were able to uh, rescue any of them, why we only had about eight or ten of them uh, aboard ship that we were able to get a hold of. Uh, and those uh, of those, I guess about four to six of them survived. Mm -hmm. And they were taken. They were the first Japanese prisoners uh, to be. Uh, brought into the United States, I believe. I don't, I don't assume you were able to interact w with the prisoners at all. Were you? Did you uh, see them? Did you? No, I didn't. Didn't uh, interact with them at all. They were uh, kept down on the main deck mm -hmm. and under guard. Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, of course, I could see them. Mm -hmm. 
Was that the the first time that you actually engaged in combat with the enemy uh, beyond the attack at Pearl Harbor? Oh, uh, well, that's probably one of the first. One of the first. Uh, the other one would be somewhere else in Alaska where we were bombarding the their uh, landing areas in Kiska. Mm. Right. That's right, because the Japanese invaded the Aleutian Islands and had, had yeah. soldiers on the land, right? Yeah, I remember that. Um, so, kind of just take me through your war experience. Uh, where did you go after the Aleutians? Well, we, uh, of course, right, right after Pearl Harbor, we did a lot of convoy right. duty back and forth to the U.S. Uh, we encountered some interesting sea conditions on one of the trips. Must have been an under underwater uh, volcano earthquake or something or other because the, uh, the swells, the surface of the ocean was fairly calm, but the swells were so heavy, so big, uh, they were 50 feet or so high. Wow. Uh, and we were convoying uh, some uh, uh, merchant ships. Mm -hmm. Forgotten whether we were going to or from the mainland, but um, we'd 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 ride up slowly. Of course, we had to go slow for the merchant ships. Mm -hmm. We'd ride up slowly up the side of this this uh, swell, and we'd. We'd uh, have a, a, a tilt of uh, more, more about forty-five degrees mm. going up, and then we get up at the top, and you get up in the top, and where where are the other ships? They were down in the hollows of the other swells, and uh, and you get down the bottom of the swell, you can't see anything. Wow! It, it was quite an interesting experience. That, those are the kinds of things that I remember. Wow. <laughs> of course, I remember some scary things, too. But, uh, but uh, those, uh, those interesting episodes at sea always stuck with me. Hmm. Um, but anyway, we did uh, convoy duty there for, for several months. And um, let's see. Uh, then we had the Battle of Midway, then um, the Aleutian. Guadalcanal? And, uh, yes, then so we came back from the Aleutians. Boy, that was a hair-raising trip from the Aleutians. There was a terrible storm mm -hmm. uh, in the North Pacific on the, on the way down. Um, when to stand uh, to change the watch, we had to. We uh, the the weather was a north northwestern uh, storm, mm. and uh, we were going south, and we were waffling back and forth uh, because of following the sea. We had to turn into the sea in order to change the watch because uh, the wallowing. Washed water over back and forth over the ship, uh, from side to side. You couldn't. Uh, you had to get out of the out of the uh, uh, crew quarters uh, onto the fantail in order to get to your uh, watch up on the bridge, or in the radio room, or in the fire control system. Um, and so we had to turn into the sea to change the watch. And the water would wash completely over the bridge. Wow. We would, we would go uh, literally uh, over one and under two, <laughs> as they say. Uh, it was it was a, a risky thing to change the watch. One guy actually lost his footing, was washed under the torpedo tubes, but he managed to to. Uh, grab onto something and was saved. 
the uh, the power of the water. We had lifelines along the uh, along the uh, uh, anyway lifelines along the ship, and um, the stanchions were pipes, steel pipes, and they were bent 90 degrees from high water. Uh, Oh, let's see. Um, so we came back to the uh, to Pearl Harbor, and we were assigned to um, we were assigned to take something down to Samoa, and uh, we made a trip down to Samoa, crossed the equator, and we. Uh, had our initiation into the into uh, Davy Crock uh, Davy Jones locker, mm -hmm. uh, Pollywogs uh, shellback shellbacks. Yeah, um, that was quite an experience. How did you celebrate that? Uh, well, our ship had uh, gone to Australia just before uh, I reported aboard. Mm -hmm. Had gone on a goodwill trip, and uh, they had crossed the equator and had done all their initiation of, from Pollywog to Shellback. And so when we went across later uh, the next year, uh, when I was a Pollywog, we had all these Shellbacks on board, ready to give us a good going over. And boy, they did! It was a, it was a, quite a. Interesting initiation. Can you describe we, that? Well, all the poly. Uh, there was a. Uh, there was an agenda. All the polywogs were identified, and each one had uh, had a separate assignment. And, um, like for example, somebody uh, had to be in the in the head. And, uh, well, let's see, I forgot how well, that goes. Anyway, so uh, there were a couple of them that had to be, uh, uh, had to have brooms and sit along the uh, gunnels of the ship up in the bow and, and roll the ship across the equator. <laughs> and uh, another guy had to, Don a uh, zoot suit outfit and uh, do the jitterbug at any time a poly any time a shellback came by and um, um, you know, things like that. Then we had to go through a gauntlet uh, or gantlet uh, with guys with sh shillelaghs uh, whacking you as you run down. Then we had to go over there and kiss the grease-covered belly of some big fat chief. <laughs> and uh, uh, there was all kinds of things like that. Oh, that's funny. Um, I, I'm curious about how a crew becomes, you know, a single unit. You know, uh, you came on to the, to the destroyer, um, you know, before they attack, of course, but um, how beyond kind of those rituals, how did the crew uh, grow to be able to function as one? Well, that's where uh, all the exercises come in. Mm. You keep doing things over and over again. You got a you got an assignment. You know, when you go to general quarters, you do this. Mm -hmm. This is your job. <laughs> <laughs> You go to the general quarters and you've got a job to do and you uh, keep practicing doing it. Mm. And uh, it comes so natural to you that when, when it actually happens, that's, you automatically go to it. I can remember in New Guinea, the difference showed up very clearly. We had, uh, our, our ship was, was uh, an experienced ship of... Uh, knew what it was doing and knew how to do it and so forth. Uh, and we had a relief 
squadron of new destroyers came in to relieve us and we were going to go back to R&R. &R. Well, they went out with us on our, on their, on our last uh, foray uh, and uh, the Japanese attacked. Mm -hmm. Well, we were all immediately at general quarters at our stations. Uh, there was one of these new destroyers that were just still running around finding their places in, for action. And they got sunk. Hmm. And it wasn't very far from where we were. Hmm. We were fairly near them. In, in a moment like that, whenever the alarm sound and there's a Japanese attack on the ship, uh, I understand that you go immediately to your job. But how do you how do you deal with that stress? It, it must feel, you know, helpless. No, I never noticed any stress, frankly. It was just it was just uh, your job. Hmm. There was no. The stress comes when you have to drag it out. Hmm. Now the attacks, boy, there's no time for uh, for stress. You're you're busy firing your gun. Or you're doing something. And, uh, but the stress comes from dragging things out. Uh, for example, uh, we were off of uh, Finchhoff, I guess it was, at night. We were protecting a landing that we had done during the day. And the Japanese sent in uh, some dive bombers to attack us. Well, this was dark. It was dark night. We couldn't see the planes. Mm -hmm. They could see our silhouettes. So we uh, uh, burned black smoke. We burned oil and created black smoke. And we steamed inside this black smoke. We were staying on station off the beach. Uh, it lasted uh, from about midnight all through the rest of the night. And, and what would happen all through the rest of the night is that some of their bombers would come in and drop a bomb. Think uh, at something they think they saw. Might come close, might hit something. Who knows? You don't know. You, you can hear the plane coming in. You can hear the bomb coming down. Hear the explosion of the bomb. Well, and then another plane comes in and does the same thing. Well, this went on all night. Uh, we were in pretty bad shape uh, in, for defense because as the new uh, as the light from the dawn lit up the eastern horizon, they could they could see more. They could see the uh, silhouettes of the ships. We couldn't uh, still give away our uh, location by firing our guns. Right. So we devised, uh, they devised a system of uh, making believe that our air cover was on the way over to attack, to defend us. Even though, even though our air cover wouldn't be able to take off for another half hour because of the light. Uh, and they, and uh, this device uh, uh, that we worked up had uh, had uh, one of our uh, frequencies on a well. They, they we had high frequency radio communication, and uh, we knew the Japanese were monitoring it. So we had uh, some voice talking about. Uh, uh, taking the position of the head of the aircraft, uh, of our own aircraft squadron, uh, taking off. And, uh, and then we had another person talk as if he were the captain of that squadron, responding. And we'd, uh, we'd communicate back and forth on this high, these high-frequency uh, channels. We knew the Japanese were... Um, 
monitoring our channels, and um, they thought, as we were devising this thing, that our air cover was approaching us. They'd say, well, we're so many minutes from you and so forth. And I'll be darned if they didn't, uh, within, when I got down to about five, they were reporting our five minutes away from us. Hmm. When we got down to about five minutes, the darn Japanese turned away and went back home. Wow, it worked. And it was a good half hour, 20 minutes anyway, before the uh, our air cover actually did come. Hmm. Wow. Well, now that period of time was stressful. <laughs> because it was dragging on the threat of... Uh, of Oh, uh, killing, killing us. Yeah, it must have been terrifying. Well, it was nerve-wracking. I mean, I would imagine it would be really difficult to, to sleep in a situation like that. No, on another occasion, uh, uh, we were off in Chauvin or someplace like that, and uh, we got attacked in the middle of the afternoon. And uh, we had our own air cover, but they had uh, lots and lots of bombers and dive bombers, and our air cover was working on them. Meantime, a uh, squadron of their torpedo bombers were down on the water, moving in close, uh, close to our ships and releasing torpedoes. And uh, we were circling fast around the circle off the coast, uh, protecting our uh, landings. And um, two, two of those uh, torpedo bombers uh, released torpedoes aimed at our ship. And the captain uh, was maneuvering to avoid one, which was uh, crossing our bow. And the other one was coming in directly uh, into the center of the ship, hmm. of our ship, right, over, right underneath the mast where I was standing. And the, dropped the torpedo, and you could see the track of the torpedo. And it came right in, came right up to the ship, and the track went off on the other side. They had set the torpedo too deep. Wow. And I'll tell you, that, that was, of course, an instant thing. Yeah. I didn't have time to get scared. I, I accept all I, all I could do is holler out, look out, or something or other, and, <laughs> the captain couldn't pay any attention. He was busy maneuvering uh, to avoid the other torpedo. Mm. Well, I'll tell you, that was a lucky strike there for us. Yeah. Because we had uh, lost a ship uh, not too long before that. Uh, a uh, Japanese submarine had uh, spotted us in a column. Uh, just at dusk, and had fired a torpedo and it hit the uh, ship. It was a, a destroyer like us. Mm. Hit it right amidships, right under where I would have been standing on them, and it broke the ship apart wow. and went down in two minutes. I'm curious, um, while you're out at sea for such extended periods of time, how did you communicate back home? Were you writing letters to your family? Letters were all, the only solution. You know, we didn't have any uh, internet or satellite <laughs> or anything like that. Did you get those fairly frequently? Did you write fairly frequently? Yeah, I, I, I wrote for, uh, you know, we, not, we didn't write every day or anything like that. Yeah. But maybe once or twice, um, twice or three times a month, something like that. Who would you write? Who would you write? Oh, uh, you just that bland of things. You they'd censor. Uh, they censored all our letters. Right, right. No, I mean, who would you write? Like your mother, your brother? Yeah, but I broke my my mother, my brother. Uh, I didn't have any girlfriends. Mm -hmm. Uh. Did your family keep the letters? Yeah, she did. Uh, do you still have those? I got them now, of course. My mother's gone. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, those are really important documents, I think. Well, they're, they're just... 
<clears throat> something that lets her know I'm alive. That's all. I can't tell her anything. Can't tell her where you're at or anything. But okay. Um, what did what did I did have? I must say that I did work out a system with uh, my brother and my mother. Uh, being a a signalman and a quartermaster, I had access to the charts, and uh, I got a world chart and uh, gave it to my mother, uh, brother, hmm. and I had a code. Uh, on my letters I wrote home, if, uh, if my date was, uh, uh, say, 28 May, something or other, there was a code. If it was May 28, there was no code. <laughs> if there was a code, then uh, the the first uh, the first letter of the um, lines, first few lines, uh, were um, were substitutes for numbers, and the numbers uh, represented uh, the latitude and longitude wow. of our ship. So they were able to plot where I was. Wow, so they were able to keep up with it. That's yeah. amazing. <laughs> wow. Um, what did the crew do during these downtimes whenever there aren't these stressful moments of combat? Uh, downtimes? You mean, uh, well, we steamed from one place to another. <laughs> we were How did part you? of a task force uh, doing something or other. So you stayed busy then. There wasn't a lot of time to be bored. No, you you uh, you had your four on, eight off, you know, all the time. Mm. So and that rotated uh, each day. You had a dog watch that changed the frequent the uh, time of your duty station. I've read a lot of uh, memoirs from sailors who would gamble during <laughs> during these times. I never did that. I. Um, I, when I first joined the Navy, I guess it was a boot camp or someplace, uh, I ran into a, uh, uh, what do you call it, a dice crap game. Mm. And uh, I thought, well, what are these guys doing here? <laughs> and they're shucking the dice out and throwing money down and so forth. I didn't know much about it. I threw $5 down there and, on something, and the guy threw the dice and, I lost my five dollars within uh, fifteen seconds, and uh, I never gambled after that again. <laughs> I bet <laughs> fifteen five dollars was a lot of money in those days too. Yeah, and that's an easy way to lose your your money. Um, so, did you have any R and R? Um, any rest and relaxation? Did you go back to any ports and? Uh, well, I. We had uh, <clears throat> we went back to uh, Pearl Harbor for uh, overhaul. I mean, back to the United States for overhaul. Mm -hmm. Went to Mare Island and near San Francisco Bay, and uh, I got I, I got uh, leave to go home. I flew home on American Airlines, and uh, but there wasn't anybody around. Everybody was in the service. <laughs> Did your brother join the service? My brother was, uh, well, he uh, graduated in 44 in high school. So he was. And then he uh, went into the Merchant Marine Academy. Okay. As a. As a. Uh, uh, some kind of an officer. Okay. Uh, do you remember what year you, you got to go back home? Well, uh, let's see. Uh, it was uh, 1943. Uh, it was two years. Two years. Ago. It was two, uh, two and a half years, I guess, uh, since I'd been home. Right. And you were reassigned before the USS Reed sank, right? Yes. Where were you reassigned to? I was assigned to uh, a flotilla flagship. Uh, the flotilla uh, was 36. Uh, LCI 
LCIs that were mm -hmm. converted to gunboats. Okay. And uh, our job was to uh, provide uh, close-in support uh, for uh, landings on islands and that sort of thing. Uh, we could strafe the, strafe the jungle and what have you. And, uh, we had 12 of the ships were uh, manned with anti-aircraft guns, 20 millimeters, which could, uh, of course, strafe the, uh, strafe the uh, uh, jungle as well. And 12 of them had 40 millimeter guns, which were both anti-aircraft and, and, uh, and anti-personnel guns. And 12 of them were manned by Army personnel who, who used, uh, um, what do you call them, uh, uh, drop it in. Uh, oh, I know what you're talking about. Um, uh, mortars. 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 Um, so you were, you were working with MacArthur and the Army then at that point? Yeah, we were part of uh, uh, MacArthur's uh, Navy. And uh, this would have been going up, to working toward the invasion of the Philippines. Then, oh yeah. Um, did you participate in? Yes, we were there. Uh, can you tell? Can you talk about that? Tell me about uh, that. Well, uh, we were we uh, were part of the invasion force, landing on Lady, and uh, we did close in uh, support for um, strafing the jungle. Uh, we got uh, sniper fire. Mm -hmm. We drew sniper fire. Remember one of the, one of the uh, snipers uh, pinged the, the bulkhead right near me. Wow. Uh, but uh, mostly they missed. <laughs> um, we also uh, were part of the uh, uh, force that went around to the west side of the Philippines. Okay. And landed on uh, the northern section of Luzon in Lingayen Gulf, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, and that was. Uh, and then after that, then we. Uh, I don't think we went back to Pearl. I think we just went back to New Guinea, mm -hmm. and then we left there and and went to Okinawa. We went to. Uh, uh, the Kar Karema or uh, something or other island group that was just south of Okinawa. We did we uh, attacked that set of islands and landed force uh, forces uh, a week before the attack on Okinawa. Wow! And uh, then we went to from there to the attack on Okinawa on April first of forty five. Uh, did you did you ever witness any of the, you know, I know by 1945 there was a lot of um, desperation among Japanese troops. There was a lot of suicides, kamikaze attacks. Yes. There were civilians committing suicide in Saipan and Okinawa. Did you did you see that? Did you hear about that? Well, I didn't know. I heard about it certainly, and uh, I saw the kam kamikazes. Wow, yeah, they were. Uh, in Okinawa, they were all over the place. The kamikazes came in every afternoon in our roadstead. They were they were diving on the big ships, on the carriers and the cruisers. How did I mean? How did that make you feel to see an enemy so determined that it would commit suicide to resist? Well, actually, you get uh, in. Inspired, uh, I guess we get worked up um, emotionally to do it, and uh, we did. Actually, we did. Uh, uh, there was uh, some famous uh, air, air air force pilot who died, dove his plane after it had been struck hmm. into a Japanese ship or something or other during the very early days of the war. Was there any type of like admiration for that dedication? Well, uh, of course there was back home, and 
in the Japanese families. Right. Did did you? Uh, so I guess I'm curious. What were your impressions? Um. Well, it was just another weapon. Terrible. Uh, and it was a devastating weapon. Um. They um. Uh, they said that. Um, one out of ten of those kamikazes would always would uh, uh, statistically would hit its target. Wow. Uh, most of them got shot down. Ninety percent of them, ten percent of them had made the targets, and there was uh, almost nothing we could do about it. I mean, you could see you've seen the movies. Mm -hmm. Well, they. They're just uh, focusing on on what they're doing. So I'm also curious about your departing the ship. Did you feel any kind of I don't know sadness about leaving your crew? Uh, you mean when I got transferred? Yeah. Well, yes, I was kind of uh, sorry about that. Uh, I had my friends there. Uh, we had uh, all these experiences together, but that was the way you just, uh, that was the orders. Right. Did you and, have friends leave with you? Um, I don't believe so. At least I don't remember any. Mm. I remember uh, my friend and I, we were in um, uh, Sydney, Arbor, mm. in Australia. When I got transferred, uh -huh. um, we had been in Sydney on R and R, uh, and my friend there uh, that had been with me since uh, communication school, um, and I uh, took a weekend liberty mm -hmm. and got on the train, went up, went up the coast to get away from the Sydney, see what. A, what Australia looked like it was pretty wild and then uh, those days yeah the train I remember the trains going up seeing kangaroos bounding along side the trains even racing them wow uh, we got up to uh, I've forgotten the name of the town now uh, it was a it was a dusty town right out of the old west of uh, the 1850s, <laughs> um, no pavement, dusty town. We got, there was only one hotel. We got a room. There were bed bugs in the bed. I wow. never forgot that. Wow. Uh, and when we went to go went to get home, go uh, come back to the ship. The train wasn't running. Mm. And uh, we had a devil of a time getting back to the, tra to the ship. Mm. <coughs> we uh, actually sent a telegram to the ship. Tell you, we were stuck up here and we were trying to get back. And when we finally got back, uh, we were labeled as being over leave. Mm. And uh, I got, they, in the meantime, they had uh, gotten orders to transfer a first class signalman. Oh. And uh, I was first class signalman, and we had another one who was a senior to me. Mm. And so they picked me to transfer. They, I transferred off the ship. My, my friend, who I'd gone up the, up the coast with, uh, got hit for a uh, 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 captain's mast. Because he, we had sent this telegram that uh, told the public where our ship was. Yeah. Well, gosh, of course, everybody knew where our ship was. It was out there in the open in Sydney Harbor. But, but anyway, he got he got uh, captain's mast for that, and I got transferred and, yeah. <laughs> and let go with nothing. <laughs> wow. Um, at what point did you uh, receive the news that the USS was sunk? What's that? Did you? At what point did you realize that the U USS Reed had been sunk? I didn't know about it for at least a month after it happened. But you did hear about it during the war. 
Yeah. Mm. Uh, I mean, how how did you memorialize? Well, uh, my friend was had survived, and uh, all my all my uh, uh, colleagues on the bridge survived. Mm. So I wasn't too. Uh, the damage our ship was taken was taken over by uh, uh, everybody who had a station on the fantail of the ship and in the engine room. Uh, the back, uh, the, kana, uh, the ship was sunk by two kamikazes mm -hmm. and uh, they, had, they had blown into the side of the ship and separated the back half of the ship from the front half. Oh. Did the, the, was the ship ever recovered? No. So it sunk to the bottom? Yeah. Um, so that's mid-1944, and so... It was December 44. And so the beginning of 45, so Okinawa was after that moment then. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm curious about 1945, uh, you know, Okinawa must have been extremely, uh, it was, uh, the war was getting pretty nasty. Right. And uh, I wasn't looking forward to an uh, invasion of Japan. He wasn't? No. We were in Pearl Harbor getting ready for the invasion of Japan, though. So, were you in Pearl Harbor in August? Of 45? Yeah. Yes. So, um, what was the mood whenever you heard about the atomic bombs being dropped? Oh, well, we were very much relieved. Wow. We felt that that was, this put a gap, put us a, a, quite a leg up in the war. Mm. Nobody else had this weapon. Right. Uh, did, um, did you ever, throughout your life after the war, ever change your views on the, the usage of the atomic weapons in no, combat? Uh, no, sir. Mm. That was, uh, that was the right decision. Okay, I'm just curious. They they estimated that a million American servicemen would be injured or dead mm. from the invasion of Japan, and it would be ten million or more Japanese who would pay the price. Mm. Um. So you were whenever the war ended, you were still at Pearl Harbor then. Yes. Um. How did you celebrate the end of the war? Well, uh, we uh, uh, were all suddenly free of, uh, of uh, wartime activities, and, and uh, there was no place to go, actually. You had to decommission ships, and you had to do it someplace. There was all this scrap metal. Mm -hmm. Couldn't just go out there and sink them. <laughs> um, we, uh, our ships, our uh, 16, our 12, uh, no, our 36 ships, uh, were separated, and uh, some of them went uh, to one place and some to another. We, I was in a group of uh, maybe 12 ships that were sent to Kauai mm. to be to sit there in the harbor and wait for somebody to figure out what to do with us. Mm. And I... I had enlisted in the Navy, and my, I, my enlistment was still more than a year ago. So I, I had to go wherever they told me to go. Where did you go? Uh, well, I, I was, uh, they decommissioned the ships, and I was told to uh, get, term, get relieved if I could get back to the States. Mm. And, uh, of course, everybody was trying to get back to the States. Mm -hmm. I found a destroyer that was going back to San Francisco, and uh, I, got a, I got aboard as a passenger. Mm -hmm. um, and I landed in San Francisco, and uh, there, there again I went to the receiving station and, uh, for, just for identification. And I was told I, I uh, could have a 30-day leave if I found uh, transportation back to my home. Mm. And uh, I did. I found uh, uh, 
transportation on the railroad. Hmm. The, uh, the rail the rail cars were jammed. Uh, every seat was taken. Uh, uh, the uh, passengers were sitting in the aisles. Hmm. In the bathrooms, <laughs> it was terrible. <laughs> Uh, but the railroads were uh, privately operated, hmm. and uh, while this terrible jammed-up operation was uh, took us from San Francisco to Utah, hmm. from Utah on, different rule, a different company operated the railroad. And uh, different rules applied. Hmm. Whereas the uh, first section, they had a car for families. But in the second section, they didn't have a family uh, family uh, car. Hmm. But most of the passengers that were going east didn't realize that. Hmm. But I did. <laughs> and uh, I just moved in with a family car and had a nice seat for the rest of the trip. Wow. <laughs> All right, so we're picking back up and <clears throat> you were talking about the, the trip home. Um, I'm curious, uh, how long did it take for you to feel comfortable talking about your war experience with other people who hadn't served? Well, uh, it's only been in the last few years that I've really uh, had much interest in uh, uh, Experienced. So uh, people did yeah, yeah, Most of us were, most people I associated with were in the service. Wow. We didn't talk about our stuff for too much. Uh, I did uh, join the USS Reed reunion group. We did have reunions. Mm. And some, some of the guys were really um, gregarious. They were... Uh, they had all kinds of stories they liked to tell. I, I never was one of those. Hmm. I, I just, uh, not a storyteller, I guess. What were your plans after the war? Uh, well, uh, <clears throat> when I joined the Navy, I was thinking of making the Navy my career. Hmm. But by the time I was getting, what, toward, toward the end of the war, uh, I realized that I was up as about as far as I could go as an enlisted man anyway. Mm. And I couldn't see myself hanging around doing the same stuff for 20, 30 years more. Right. And besides that, the, uh, uh, the services had uh, picked up a lot of draftees that uh, would join the service who were, uh, had interrupted their college educations and that sort of thing, careers and so on. And uh, I learned more about what other people were doing for a living and how they were doing it and uh, what their plans were. And I could see that uh, I had the same opportunities as they had. And on top of that, uh, the uh, Congress had passed the GI Bill, which paid for college educations. Mm -hmm. for us. And that made a big difference. Right. Uh, when, and I decided I was going to go to college. Oh. Uh, when I um, got out, I went to UMass. I, of course, this was the uh, hometown. Right. Uh, I probably couldn't have got into college from my high school record. Uh, but uh, they were very, everybody was very pliable as about getting into college in those days. Mm. Colleges were welcoming uh, GIs coming in. Right. And um, so I, I got accepted. Wow. Um, my, first, uh, my first exam in mathematics was an uh, eye opener for me, I realized. I was way behind. Wow. And I had to really scrub to uh, catch up. What did you major in? Well, I was going to major in law, but uh, then I got taken up with uh, the history department. Oh, wow. We had two history professors, uh, 
Eric Carey and Theodore Caldwell impressed me, and I and I guess I was influenced by that. Uh, I got my bachelor's degree, and I looked for uh, I was going to get a PhD. Mm-hmm. So I applied at Stanford, and I went there, got my master's degree, and uh, by that time I had two kids, <laughs> married and two kids. And, and uh, it was getting too tough. Hmm. Uh, I had enrolled for a PhD program in, in uh, Clark University in Worcester, mm-hmm. but uh, I couldn't. Couldn't. Uh, I had to work. Yeah, it's hard um, doing graduate school and raising a family. I have a family. I'm in. I'm in a PhD program now. It's tough. <clears throat> and besides point- that, they weren't. There weren't too many college jobs anyway. Right. At what point did you meet your wife? When did I meet her? Yeah. Um, well, she was uh, she was a junior here at the university. Okay. And uh, I had come home on that leave that I told you about, uh, riding the train. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of my uh, special friends uh, was here at the university, and I was talking with him, and we, he uh, went with him to a junior class meeting, and he had, he told me, well, why don't we go out on a dull date? <laughs> I said, well, yeah, but I don't know anybody. Right. And uh, he says, oh, that's all right. Well, at that time, this was 1945, the end of 45, uh, there were still uh, mostly girls mm. in the uh, colleges. And there were a lot, a lot more girls than boys. Yeah. And he said, "Oh yeah, I can get you a date." <laughs> so, at the, about that time, this this uh, beautiful blonde walked by, and I said, "How about her?" And uh, I had seen that girl someplace, and I couldn't remember where. But hmm. uh, anyway, he um, he didn't know who she was. He found out though. He made arrangement. Made the date for me, wow. and uh, I showed up at her front door, and, and uh, we went out on a date. Boy, that was the that was it. Yeah, and so you've and been together was, ever since. It was uh, love first night. Wow, that's quite some friend you have. Yeah, <laughs> um, good. Um, I was ready, I guess. Yeah. You well, know, you, you. I've been out on dates before, and <clears throat> in Hawaii and San Francisco and so forth, but uh, it was all temporary stuff. Right. Awesome. Um. Uh. So, before I get to my concluding part, um, not to go back to the war too much, but I'm curious because I've I've interviewed a a lot of veterans over the past seven years. Um. Uh, not so many with World War II, but uh, especially with Vietnam and uh, the current generation of Iraq and Afghanistan veterans. And um, I, I, I'm very interested in, in PTSD and trauma. And I'm just curious, did you ever experience any nightmares or other types of psychological no. problems after the war? No, no emotional problems. No. Uh, I just wasn't... Uh, I just didn't encounter the kind of stuff that uh, Vietnam veterans had to put up with. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was glad I was in the Navy and not in the Marines or the Army. Right. Hmm. Uh, I realized that uh, our our jobs were a lot different than theirs and a lot more secure. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was thankful that I wasn't in those services. To this uh, current generation, or even the next generation of veterans who are coming home from war, what advice would you give them? Well, to take advantage of uh, all the uh, to take advantage of all the opportunities that are available to you now as a result of your service. Mm. To uh, take advantage of them and so as to uh, advance your own career. 
right. and your family's well-being. Wow. Um, and I feel like I could spend another interview talking to you just about your family life, your time here at UMass, uh, your your children, your grandchildren, because you've lived a long life. Um, and so any two-hour interview is going to never cover it all. No, right. um, but, you know, if if you had some words of wisdom to share with, you know, your great-grandchildren, the, the ones who are just learning to walk <laughs> right now, um, what would that advice be? What would you want them to know about life based on your own experiences? You've got to keep up with what's going on in the world. Uh, that's one thing as an old person. Uh, I found I'm slipping away uh, from uh, being a current uh, human being in the world and it's new digital age, it's uh, artificial intelligence. Um, you've got to keep up with, uh, with the uh, progress mm. and um, be part of it. Mm. It's easy to find a, a simple way of growing up, but it doesn't pay off. It's, uh, there's not much, um, not much, not much to say for it. Uh, there's not much opportunity, not much challenge. Uh, you need to be challenged. Hmm. You know, one of the things, uh, I often think of myself as an observer of, of the war, because I, I remember things that uh, don't have anything to do with war. Mm. Um, like seeing these masses of acres and acres and acres of pulsating light on the surface of the ocean at night. You get the phytoplankton just pulsing. Uh, gosh, what, a, what an amazing sight that is. Or to see St. Elmo's fire ripping across the yard arm of your ship. Uh, watching a, an albatross hardly ever flicking a wing, just cruising along right alongside of us. Mm going just as fast as we are, but hardly ever moving a wing or a feather. Um, there was, gosh, when we first got radar, we were out uh, doing some exercises and we picked up a blip on the radar um, and it kept disappearing like uh, it was a periscope sticking up and the waves were going before it. And we thought, well, maybe that's what it is. Uh, captain decided to go to general quarters, just to be sure. Hmm. We kept our binoculars fixed on the spot where they said it was. And, and finally, we spotted it. It was a coconut. Another time off of uh, uh, New Guinea, we were uh, we had we were on a a mission, and we had fighter directors fighter uh, cover, and we had the control of the fighters in on our ship. An Air Force officer would actually come on our ship and and uh, be the uh, uh, the squadron leader or something, tell them what to do. Hmm. And uh, our lookout spotted uh, something up in the sky and uh, uh, looked like uh, it might have been a, a, another plane. Hmm. 
but there were scattered clouds so that you couldn't keep it in sight. Our fire director, which uh, tried to spot it and get a fix on it, you know, a fire director brings two, two uh, uh, pictures together and brings them together. That tells you how, what the distance is. Uh, well, he, he couldn't bring them together because uh, the clouds kept mm -hmm. going through it. We kept, and uh, the fighter director in our ship kept sending the planes higher and higher and higher. They couldn't find it either. Finally, somebody figured out that that was the planet Venus. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, That's amazing. Uh, a lot of things like that going on. Um, and I usually ask this question to uh, not just veterans, but but to to most people I interview, because um, I understand that you've you've seen a lot of change in in your life. Um, and so this question involves kind of the best and and the worst of humanity. So, uh, what have you? What are the best aspects of humanity, and what are the worst aspects that you've personally witnessed or experienced yourself? Well, that's a tough one. I don't dwell on dwell on those things and. Uh, I'm sure if I thought about it, I could think of some best uh, demonstrations of humanity. I don't really, I can't really answer that. Sure. Um, no problem. Uh, what are some of the greatest changes that you've seen throughout your life? Greatest changes? Um, well, I think uh, the computers has uh, been the biggest change. Mm -hmm. I was in on the beginning of the computer age, but I fell by, fell, <laughs> fell by the wayside. Right. Um, um, I was in the beginning of a lot of things, like uh, uh, submarine-fired uh, missiles. Mm -hmm. I was I was working in the Nash, in the uh, Polaris program at the time that was developed. Uh, I was I was there. I wasn't there actually to see it, but I was working with this system that. When the George Washington fired the first successful missile mm -hmm. uh, from a submarine, do you have advice for for young people, young Americans, about um, you know civic duty? Or yeah, I, th I think uh, we all. Uh, I, th I think. There is a civic responsibility. We we need to uh, each of us needs to participate mm -hmm. in a democracy. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, it get, does get contentious. I was. Uh, I've been elected uh, three times to county commissioner, mm. county supervisor, actually. Mm. Uh, I don't know. I've been I haven't been deep thinking about those things lately. Mm. I understand. Um, 
Is there anything throughout this interview that you wanted to talk about that I haven't asked or that you wanted to go back to? Ooh, let's see. Well, I appreciate your asking the question to stimulate response. Um, There's a um, the sea is an interesting place. <laughs> uh, there are uh, things I remember. I remember a you know, tense night. No, no lights on the ship. No moon out. Heading with us, one cruiser and another destroyer heading for to look out for the for an enemy task force. Had the had the night watch. A streak of light comes through the ocean right directly toward our ship. Boy, I tell you, the hackles of my uh, my back and my neck went up, and uh, all of a sudden. It veered off, and it was a darn porpoise. <laughs> and uh, came swimming right up to us, and then breaking off. And he was stirring up the phytoplankton as, mm -hmm. as he uh, swam toward us. Yeah. And he was going about as fast as a torpedo would go, too. I tell you, they can move. Um, you know, I find it so incredibly interesting how in in the last section of this interview, you've kind of um, created this contrast, right, between nature and man. Like, uh, the feeling of being out on an ocean and the peacefulness and the lights and space, while it seems like you're creating these moments of peace in a time of war. And I think that that's just... Uh, amazing to think about mm. um and and it seems to me that you seem very connected to the planet to to life itself um i, I just wonder what what do you have to say about that uh it, you before we started this interview you mentioned climate change in virginia it seems like you, you're very observant of nature and i'm just well, well yeah Yeah, unfortunately, I think uh, we're we're heading in a, a direction we can't get a, we can't um, change. Hmm. Uh, we are overpopulating the planet. Mm -hmm. We've been doing that for generations. Uh, we're wiping out species. We're using up our resources. Uh, it, uh, it's going to come to a cataclysmic end, eventually. Mm. And who knows how it's going to happen, but how or when it's going to happen. Do you, do you find inspiration in, in younger people who are thinking a lot more about that these days? Well, I, th I think uh, educated people are, tend to think uh, more about population control. Mm. Um, unfortunately, I think the some of the religions are just uh, defeating any effort of, in that area. Mm. Uh, I'm not a religious person. I, I I can can see I can see that people some people need religion. Mm. Uh, I don't know why, but they do. At what point in your life did you stop considering yourself a religious person? Oh, when I, you know, when I, uh, was in the National Science Foundation, I guess, uh, I realized that uh, we're in a physical world. We're not, we're not in a, 
not in a world governed by some God, some human formed God mm. you know, watching over us. Mm. We're, we're just a piece of, uh, of the universe. Mm. I don't, uh, I can't see that, uh, that our life after death is uh, any significance to the universe. Hmm. The universe is so vast, I mean, it, it, we could be just a molecule on a, on a, uh, a person of uh, humongous size. <laughs> right. Living on a, an atom uh, that represents our solar system. Hmm. Well. I have two more questions for you, if you'll give me the, the opportunity. Um, one is, you know, after being married for how many years? Almost 71. 71 years. What advice do you have for uh, for young people like myself who are, you know, still in the earlier stages of marriage? Oh, uh, well, I guess uh, the main thing to remember about marriage is that it takes each one of you to give 90%. Mm. <laughs> no 50 <laughs> 50 that's that's great I love that I'm gonna quote that to my wife <laughs> um, my final question is uh, when history is written what do you want to say about you about me yeah mm. <laughs> well uh, I don't know I don't know what to say in other words, how do you want to be remembered? Whether it be by history or just your family. Oh, I'd like to be remembered as having fun with my children and my grandchildren. Mm -hmm. uh, and that uh, we're all... all loved each other as family. Mm -hmm. we, for, uh, I'm very fortunate that we don't have any... Um, negative people in my family. Hmm. <laughs> uh, no, no rival rivalries that I know of. Hmm. Each of us has uh, succeeded in his own way. And, uh, I'm, I'm grateful for that. I think, I, I think I've been fortunate and having a great family. Mm. That's awesome. And it sounds to me like you've been very successful at that. You've had, you have a large, loving family, multiple mm. children, grandchildren, great grandchildren. Um, yeah, I have. Um, um, it's been a, an incredible honor to speak with you today. And I, I want to thank you not only for. Well, your I wish I could be more philosophical, but, uh, <laughs> but at my age, I've, I've lost my ability to come up with things philosophy uh, makes my, my head hurt anyway <laughs> it, it makes me feel kind of stupid usually <laughs> like a philosophy class <laughs> um, but you know thank you for you know teaching me about your world and sharing your history with me it's a profound honor really oh well we're good I appreciate your taking the time to do it I don't I don't imagine it's going to be a, a great document for Posterity, but as my my contribution, we'll have to disagree on that then. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>